No Hiti Modi South Africana Umit Nai. At the outbreak of war, it presented both that and Smuts and the Union leadership with opportunities to strengthen their new state in the context of supporting the British Empire. Even so, continued ties to Britain remained a source of discomfort for a significant minority of Boer leadership. There was long-standing antagonism between the Boers and the Brightons, coupled with Britain's harsh treatment of anti-guerrilla campaigns during the Second Boer War. They made it difficult for some to reconcile themselves on fighting a war on the British side, especially since Germany gave arms to the Second Boer Republic, even asking the phrase, who did we fight first, the British or the Germans? The test of Boer loyalty in the Union government came when Britain declared war on Germany in August 1914. Many South Africans of British descent supported the war, while the Afrikaners and the Boers and the Indians held various opinions. Both as much debated with their more reticent colleagues in the cabinet about Britain's request for South African forces to invade German Southwest Africa to their new Nubia. That month, the cabinet decided to grant Britain's request, but only if the South African Parliament agreed and volunteer troops were noosed. During the cabinet's deliberation, several well-known Boer military and political leaders began to plot a coup against the British rule. When Britain declared war and the South African government joined, those Boer dissidents declared their independence and led a 101,500 mounted soldiers on raids in rural areas in the hopes of sparking a widespread rebellion. This would be known as the Marty Moritz Rebellion or the Boer Rebellion. They also led a loyal unit against the rebels and succeeded in capturing or killing almost most of them. Borsa's main mission was to lead South African forces against the Germans in Southwest Africa. The, the country occupies approximately twice the land area of Germany, but German Southwest Africa was mainly arid environment, ensuring that the population was about 300,000, whereas Germany's was 65 million. 14,000 German settlers had emigrated to Southwest Africa, attracted by farmlands in the vicinity of Weinhoek in the interior. Their settlement, Their settlement was, made was made possible by the genocidal wars that the German army had fought between 1904 and 1908 against the Hiro heroes and local pastorals who revolted against the German rule. The German campaign reduced their numbers from 75,000 to 15,000 and took the lives of many thousands of the Nami and the Basta neighbours as well. During Some of the surviving Germans that went on to fight in the First World War in the African campaign would later influence the Nazi party. The extent of the ideological and the experiential connections had already been contested. For white South Africans, a greater sense of unity grew out of the experience for their countrymen in France. In July 1915, the South African government began to form a brigade of white volunteers to serve in Belgium and France, mainly consisting of English speakers that were trained in South Africa by the British forces. During in early 1916, the first components of the unit had left for Egypt, where they would serve with other colonial forces before being sent to France for the Somme Offensive. The Springbok Brigade, as they were called, developed a very particular style. Many volunteers traced their origins to Scotland, so most of the soldiers wore kilts. They became well known for singing Afrikaners and Zulu while they cultivated a reputation for frontier marksmanship. In France, they were assigned to the British 9th Division, which was also the Scottish Division. During the 12th and 15th of July 1916, at the height of the Battle of the Somme, the Spring Brooks were deployed on the front line. They attacked heavily fortified German positions at Delvo Wood and the nearby town of Long Develle. With the artillery support, 3,105 South Africans surged forward to find the Germans staging an orderly retreat. The Springboks secured their position as best as they could. It was especially difficult to dig in trenches in the woods where the roots would get in the way of the shovels. On the 15th of July, the South Africans were counter-attacked by the German forces twice their size. The German artillery fire hit South African positions with pinpoint accuracy, shredding trees and turning wood into a storm of splinters. Communications and resupply became extremely difficult. The battle raged on for five days with reinforcements pouring in on both sides. On the 21st of July 1916, the South African began withdrew with only 779 soldiers left. The Springboks suffered approximately 750 deaths as well as 1,050 missing, wounded or captured. These were the worst casualties suffered by any British brigade during the war, or Dominion. Their sacrifice did foster a greater sense of unity among English-speaking white South Africans and show that their country could make an important contribution on the world stage. While the brigade did go on to fight other battles, most notably Passchendaele in 1917, it was Delvel Woods that cemented its reputation. The it was the dreadful East African campaign that the South African soldiers and the laborers made their greatest contribution. At the start of 1916, the British appointed Jan Smuts to command the British forces in East Africa. Smuts did not have training as a professional soldier, rather he would lose his experience as an officer from the Second Boer War. Smuts yeah. did not have training as a professional soldier. He used his experience as an officer from the Second Boer War. 
he was familiar with the long-standing method of the Boer Warfare, the Commando, in which the horsemen rode onto the scene of battle, dismounted, fired, remounted and then manoeuvred or even flanked the enemy out. This type of this formation was also called mounted infantry, in particular it was well suited for the terrains and the subtropical climate of South Africa. However, Smuts decided to rely on mounted Europeans for the campaign against the famous Paul von Lettau Vorweg. African soldiers were disastrous for reasons that had too much to do with two diseases that were prevalent in Tanzania and other countries in Central and East Africa, malaria and typhanomamias or sleeping sickness. The first debilitated one and then killed him. The second one debilitated and killed people and their animals as well, including horses and cattle. Children in malaria regions died in great numbers but those who survived continued to be exposed to the mosquitoes that spread the disease and developed some resistance. Leto Vordvek African soldiers had many resistance while the Europeans on the smuts did not. British forces laboured under the further disadvantage of understanding and how to prevent the disease less well than their German counterparts. Smuts was sufficiently wedded to the idea about the superiority of the Europeans that he did not initially consider the new South African troops himself, although later in the campaign African troops contributed greatly and significantly. Conditions in East Africa brought manpower issues to the forefront. At the start of his 1916 campaign, Smuts was available for 70,000 men to him, including units of the Belgian Congo, Portuguese Mozambique, and the British Kenya, as well as South Africa. Let Al Warbeck commanded 16,000 men, mostly Askaris. Smuts captured the ports of the German East Africa and waged a far ranging campaign against much smaller German forces. By January 1917, when Smuts left East Africa to become a member of the War Cabinet in London, most, most German the, Africans were under a nominal British control, satisfying Smuts' imperialist ambitions. Nevertheless, German forces were still at large, proving that German imperialism has still a vitality left in it. The German campaign showed that the Portuguese in Mozambique were quite vulnerable. The two countries went to war officially in March 1916. Portugal dispatched 5,000 poorly armed and poorly trained men to Mozambique to defend the border with German East Africa, and they and took the area of the border known as the Coyongo Triangle. In September 1916, cross-border fighting resulted in more than 1,000 Portuguese deaths and political embarrassment. Portuguese reinforcements were sent yet could not prevent another German invasion in November 1917. The forces of von Lethal Vorve entered Mozambique and neighbouring colonies almost at will. In 1917, Smuts was replaced first by British Major General Reginald Hoskins, commander of the King's African Rifles, the KARs, who understood local conditions better than Smuts, and worked to replenish their exhausted forces. In June, acting on the advice of Smuts, the British government mistook rebuilding for inaction and replaced Hotskins with Jacob Van Venter, an Afrikaner amateur like Smuts, but unlike Smuts and Hotskins, Van Venter was less interested in territorial expansion and more interested in destroying German forces. German <coughs> officers continued their guerrilla warfare campaigns and pillaged African villages and raided Portuguese and British bases for much needed supplies. The Portuguese and the British efforts had failed repeatedly to capture or even eliminate the Germans. In the final weeks of the war, with little more than a hundred German soldiers and a thousand Askaris remaining under their command, Leto Vorvet crossed into northern Rodinija. There, the British the South African Company had presided over several years of strain and privation. Now the appearance of the Germans had begun to inspire a revolt, but now it was averted because of the war's end in Europe. Von Lettau Vorvet was obligated to surrender on the 25th of November, making the German East African campaign the longest campaign of World War One. The East African campaign had devastating effects on the local economies. More than 2,700,000 men were conscripted in northeast Rhodesia alone, with thousands taken from other British colonies as well as Portuguese Mozambique. Laborers in military service died at the rate of 2% per month. Villages emptied with men stuffed from hunger and disease as courts were not cultivated and sleeping sickness spread. It were also worsened by the influenza epidemic of 1918 and even a outbreak of a plague in Africa. To add insult to injury, wartime inflations persuaded colonial rulers to impose higher taxes. The stricken people of the region became so destituted that they were seen wearing animal skins and tree bark. As Africans starved, the small German forces challenged the British Empire and the South African forces on the battlefield with burned crops and of course Scotch Earth policy. The East African campaign taxed manpower reserves throughout South Africa to the limit, thanks in large part to environmental conditions. The presence of the Tsi fly and the sleeping sickness necessitated the noose of African porters, even though porters and soldiers alike succumbed to great numbers by malaria and intestinal diseases. The British the Empire British deployed a total of 1,100,000 soldiers in East Africa, many of them recruited from Uganda, Kenya and Nasiriland.
as well as the ranks from the African soldiers who had fought for the Germans. The South African government refused to allow its own African men to serve as soldiers except for the 1st Battalion of the Cape Corps, which were spent most of the time in 1916 and 1917 in the theatres and lost 165 men. And it was a coloured division as well, it was a mixed race division. Out of the total number of African soldiers, over 10,000 died, mostly from disease. A total of 1 million porters were recruited for all around East and Southern Africa, and these two died of approximately of the rate of 10%, almost 100,000 total in death. The First World War did not persuade the indigenous people of South Africa of the benevolence of the colonial settlers, the administrators, and the soldiers. Nor did it serve the purpose of producing a greater sense of unity in any of the colonies, mostly the Zulu Nation, the Transvaal, the Orange Free State and the Republic of South Africa, among many other African reserves, except mostly among the white settlers of South Africa. Some, Some of, of these the... would try to remember the war in a meaningful sacrifice, but most of the South Africans died, and this was not the case. The war exacerbated social patterns in Africa that were already familiar among the mining revolutions and the imperial conquest of the late 19th century. While men left home, basic production had gone increasingly by women who were left by children and the elderly. Cities expanded, a wartime job opportunities arose. Certain industries, such as diamond mining, were now disrupted. Gold mining continued even though under strain, while farming experienced growth and manufacturing boomed. Prices rose, while fostered unrest and like every strikes and rebellions, were in always in some place. The terms of surrender were mutually advantageous. Both those government allowed the German reservists to return to their farms in the exception that the South African administrations of South West Africa would depend on the lower settlers dominating the majority African people, just like it had in the Union. This continuity meant that the German settlers had little to regret about the change of administration through the German national ambitions for an African empire that was torpid. <coughs> the, the lives of the individual settlers remained much the same, meanwhile the South African expansionists and nationalists received the boost. South Africa and South West Africa became integrated into the South African economy through investments in mines and other businesses as well as the development of railroads, ports and roads. Nevertheless, the peace settlement of 1919 supplemented that the South Africans could not incorporate South West Africa, instead South Africa was to govern South West Africa for a time as a mandate for the League of Nations, a big leaf of sorts for the extension of settlers' colonialism. And that's basically South Africa in World War I. The Boers. Van Zitsen, Botha, Daigurut Crocodile, all of them were South Africans. But have you ever met a nice South African before? I don't know, you tell me in the comments if you ever met a nice South African. And if you don't get the joke, I will post it in the description. It's basically a, it's basically a song, so yeah, I re-recorded all of this just for a song. Just to make the silly reference for a song that is like four years old and more to do with the apartheid South Africa and the Cold War tensions between the East and West for that especially when the Soviet Union was becoming like 1990 I believe so South Africa having apartheid was not seen in the eyes of the world as necessary, necessary anymore and not even necessary to begin with but hope you enjoyed it, hope you learned something about South Africa and um, this is the last time I'm doing this accent, this is so hard I, I don't think you know how much words I have toppled with this accent. But it was kind of fun to do something else. Australia is going to be a chore. New Zealand is going to be handled by Caleb because it's like an Australian accent, but like a like a South Rhodonesian Australian accent, the best way I could put it. A slow down version and a louder but not as nasally version of Australia. Sorry, Australia, but it is what it is. Anyway, hope you learned something and... And that's pretty much it, yeah. I would leave the link, and if you want to read further into the subject, you may. But uh, anyway, learn something, read something, and generally do something, because why, uh, why, why are you in front of the computer for 12 hours? So go and do something. Alright, learn something.